Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education Part 7. This is session 54. Um, we were looking last time where Ezekiel was asking if God was going to make a full end to the remnant of Israel. And I want to give you that response and then we'll look at why we, we came over here. But this is all part and parcel of the same thing. Verse 16, Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them far off. Do you see that phraseology there? I meant to highlight it, didn't do it, but you see it. This is the issue. Though I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel." And they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof, and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh. Now, before we keep reading, do you recognize anything that he's saying right there? Does that bring anything to your mind? That we have studied way back when we first started Sonship Orientation. One of the first issues that we looked at back there. We went through the issue of the covenants. And there's one covenant in particular that had two aspects to it. And you're looking at those aspects here. Do you remember what covenant that was? The new covenant. The new covenant. It was going to provide for Israel's spiritual fitness. A perfect justification, a perfect sanctification. He's talking about here, not doing physical things for them. This is not about crops or animals or sicknesses or any of that stuff. These are spiritual issues. I will give them one heart, put a new spirit within you, take the stony heart uh, out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, uh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people and I will be their God. You see, that is going to get healed eventually. But God is doing that. He is doing that because where they've come to the fifth course of punishment. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. By the way, even if you're going to serve the Lord, do you, do you get to not go away into captivity? No. I mean, that, you're still going. Fifth course of punishment, and there it is. Okay. Now, I brought us over to Ezekiel to see that in the process of him casting them off, he is going to disassociate himself. And now we pick this up in verse 22, the next verse. Then did the cherubims lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over, above them, uh, over them above, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city, and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Afterwards the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. Then I spake unto them of the captivity all the things that the Lord had showed me. Now the thing I'm really after here is he's talking about that the Lord, the cherubims, remember they're actually, they're actually the things that are moving the Lord's throne, is lifted up from the midst of the city and it, and it says that <clears throat> they went over and stood, let me just back it up, the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Now I've been on that mountain, it is the Mount of Olives. It's where Jesus uh, uh, lectured in Matthew 24. We call it the Olivet Discourse. Just to show you something about that mountain that's on the east side of the city. And by the way, if you're looking at it, I'm just going to draw it as a square. It's not exactly like that. But over on the east side of the city, this is the Mount of Olives. By the way, when you say the Mount of Olives, don't think about Mount Everest. That's, it's not anything like that. Don't even think about something you'd see in the Rocky Mountains. It's not like that. You're standing up on the Mount of Olives, but it's not, it's not like you're up there at you know, 40,000 feet and oxygen deprived. You're, you're up and you're able to look and when you see the city. And, uh, and by the way, that is built in a very particular way. 
The, the, the poorest people in the city built in the lowest spots. The more affluent you were, the higher up that you built. And there's actually places in the city where you can look and you, can, you see these houses. It's hard to see the 3D of it because as things go up, the houses go up and they're just like, kind of like one in front of another, in front of another, covering up the bottom of this one, the top of this one. This is a, you know, all of that like that. And it goes up. And what you'd have is you'd have the king's house at the, almost the top. What sat at the top? The Lord's house is how that went. But anyway, you have the Mount of Olives, which is over here. Now let me show you. I'm going to take you over to Zechariah chapter 14. Um, and and, and uh, we read that. I just backed up. It is. It is. It's just a hill. It is. I, I think when they talk about a mount, you don't necessarily need to think about a huge mountain, but a mounding up, area, a mounded up area. Okay. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. That's, he didn't tell you it was the Mount of Olives back there. But here it does. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north. And half of it toward the south. And so now let me take you back to Ezekiel verse 23. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Now you know from Zechariah what that was. That was the Mount of Olives. And then, and by the way, when he says... Uh, uh, on the east side of the city, you know what that is. The city mentioned here, of course, is Jerusalem. It didn't, it didn't say that, but you know that what is. It's the city that God took to put His name there. Now, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8. And the Lord hath performed His word that He spake, and I am risen up in the room of David my father, and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. This is Solomon talking. He built a house for the Lord to put His name there. One more scripture about that. Verse 29, That thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou said, My name shall be there. And of course, that's when he hearkens unto their prayer. Remember, they're praying toward that house, you know, facing. Uh, now, so when Paul talks about that, and you saw what the Lord did. He went there from the midst of the city and he goes out to the east side of the city to the Mount of Olives. From there, he's going to continue to move out to the border of the land of Israel and from there, he's going to leave the earth. I, I just showed you one little step of the progression because I didn't want to get too bogged down in that. But what I'm trying to say is God distancing Himself, God removing Himself, God disassociating Himself from the people and saying... You're not going to be my people. I'm not going to be your God. That is the same kind of issue that Paul is talking about when he says we are to cast off those works of darkness. There is going to be a public and open, open declaration of our disdain and hatred for them and our distancing ourselves from that. In other words, making sure and saying that I don't have anything to do with that. Now, by the way, this is not mildly done, although you don't have to say it in a shouting voice, but this is not like, well, you know, so-and-so did, you know, th this, you know, you see some of this, uh, the great wantonness of the works of darkness. It's not like, well, I mean, I don't think I would ever do that, but, you know, live and let live. It's not that kind of thing, like I can take it or leave it. This is... A public repudiation of that. This is, I don't want anything to do with that. I want no part in that. And I want everyone here to know I am not associated with that. I'm just giving you a lot of different ways to say that, but this is the kind of issue that's being talked about in casting off the works of darkness. Now we're going to go over to the book of Second Chronicles. And... Um, there's, a, there's an interlude. You know how this happens on the timeline. Uh, you have the... Um, uh, the, the first, now, I, I'm actually going to back us up on the timeline here. You have the time of the judges, which is the 450 years under the judges, and that's the, the first course of punishment. And then 
you have this interlude where you have David and Solomon and and God really expands the kingdom and gives them a foretaste of the kingdom. When that's over, they're, you know what, the condition they're in, they go right into the second uh, course of punishment. And uh, this is where I'm going to take us to. Uh, that, that we're going to look at something here. Solomon has died. And what do you know is part of the punishment of the second course of punishment? The kingdom is divided. It's divided into those two parts, that northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Israel and Judah. And he talked about that, we're not going to go back and look at it, in Leviticus 26 where he said, I will break the pride of your power. When that thing actually happens, when Solomon has died, then you have two kings that come along. I really want to get rid of that just for a second here, if I can. But you have a couple of kings here. You have Jeroboam over Israel, which is the ten tribes of the northern kingdom. And then you have Rehoboam over the southern kingdom, the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah. And um, you have to understand that when that kingdom gets divided, not only does it break their power, because as their enemies that are about them, they are no longer going to be able to rely on each other for protection against the nations around them. And not only are they not going to be able to rely on each other, there is going to be, I'll tell you where this is going so that you'll understand it, these two kingdoms are going to cast each other off. They're going to have nothing to do with each other. In fact, they are hostile toward each other. And at the beginning, there is going to be a war between them. And even though it was predicted back in Leviticus 26, Rehoboam is going to get it together. He's going to attack Israel. He's going to bring the ten tribes back in. And God says, hey, wait a minute. I'm the one doing this. Don't go attack them. I'm the one that made this division. So he holds off. But it only holds off for a while because as soon as the, the second course of punishment is over, when you get into the third course of punishment, they do go to war with each other. So there's open hostility between them. And um, so let me give you a little bit of background here. When we get into the Chronicles passage, Solomon dies, and then the kingdom gets itself divided. Rehoboam is going to go to a place called Shechem. And I have a map for you. It's not in your notes, but I'm going to put it on the PowerPoint. I have a map for you that kind of shows you. Oh, man. Did I skip that? I guess so. Let me just read it to you. I'm sorry. We talked about it. God's removing his... You know, remember, he was casting off the, t the, the city and the temple. Remember where he was going to put his name? And we saw that. And so here's what he says. Then I will cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them. And this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out of my sight. And Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among the people, among all people. So... This, this is the result of, of, of what they have done here. Okay, now with that in mind, let me see if I can get you to this map. There's a lot of things on here. I used to have a laser pointer, and now I don't. But let me just show you. Um, you can see Mount Gerizim in the middle. Um, it's, it's just down from the halfway point of the map. You see Samaria right in the smack dab middle? come down from Samaria and you have the city of Samaria and you have Sychar right below that is Shechem that's the city that the crowning was going to take place now, after when Solomon dies here's what's happened down here in Egypt this guy Jeroboam has been in hiding Solomon dies and they come to Rehoboam and they say you, you know what? Your father Solomon put a lot on us and it was like being under a taskmaster and we want to know if you're going to ease up a little bit and lighten our burden. And so he goes to, 
his father's advisors, and Rehoboam says, what do you think? And they said, you need to lighten up on these people a little bit. Don't be hard on them. And if you'll do this, they will love you and follow you and be loyal to you. Then he goes to his young advisor. He's got his own set. You know, some skateboarder guys, you know, X-game guys. And so he goes to the younger set and he says, what do you guys think? And they think, you tell them this. Solomon whipped you with whips. I'll whip you with scorpions. If my father did this, I'm going to double what he did. It's not going to be easier. It's going to be tougher. Well, guess which advice he takes? He takes the younger set of advisors' advice. And so he comes and he says that very thing. My father chastised you with whips. I'll chastise you with scorpions. You think it was tough under him? You haven't seen anything yet. Well, the ten tribes up here, they're going, in fact, we're going to read it. They're going to go, hey, we've had enough of this. We want nothing to do with Rehoboam. So you know what they're going to do? They're going to put Jeroboam in charge. So they're up there at Shechem. They're going to crown the, you know, you know, the king, and then all of this breaks loose. And, uh, and by the way, let me just say something else before we start reading in the Second Chronicles chapter 10. Shechem, as soon as... And by the way, Rehoboam runs for his life out of there to get back to Jerusalem. Then they install Jeroboam as the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. And when they do, Shechem is the capital. Originally, they make it the capital. It changes, in, in, in Jeroboam's reign, it changes two more times before finally it moves to Samaria. See the city right up above that? I don't know if it's too little for you to see from back there. But Samaria becomes the capital of the northern kingdom eventually. And so, anyway, it kind of moves around. But Shechem is the place where he's going to go, and then he says to them what he says, and they decide, we don't want you, and then he, and then he hightails it out of there. Now, you have to understand that Shechem had the privilege of being a Levite city. Now, let me just talk to you about this for a moment. Scattered throughout the land of Israel were 48 cities called Levitical cities. In the 12 tribes, there were 48 of those. And they were scattered all throughout the whole entirety of the, orig of, of the land of Israel. All 12 tribes were given an inheritance. But you know what? The Levites were not part of the 12. They were a 13th tribe. But they didn't get a land grant. Now, one day, I'll bring a picture up here and show you how the different tribes controlled different land areas, you know, who controlled what, but they were given land grants. The Levites weren't given a land grant. So you know what they were given? They were given 48 cities. That way, the priesthood could be scattered all throughout the land, and they could instruct the people of Israel all over the nation in the ways of the Lord. That's what that was designed to do. And the way their property was handled was different from the way normal property was handled. Let's take Bertha, for example. Bertha's living in Israel, and she's got, you know what, she, she, she needs some money, and uh, she's, a, she's a Levite, let's say she's of the house of Levi, and, and so, you know what, she sells her home. Let's don't make her the tribe of Levi. For this illustration, let's not. She sells her home. And when she sells it, she gets the money, and now she gets to do what she wants to with it. But somebody else owns her home. In that same city, one of the Levites sells their home. And, and let's suppose that something happens and Bertha comes into money at some point, and she decides, I want my home back. Ruby bought her home. And she comes to Ruby and she says, I want my home back. And Ruby goes, hey, I bought that home. Well, yeah, I want it back. And Ruby goes, yeah, well, I like it too. So I'm keeping it. And she can. But a Levite, if he sold his house for money and later was able to buy the house back, now let's make um, Clifford the Levite, he sells his house, and Ruby buys it. She's a land baron. Who, didn't, who knew? All right, 
So he, he sells this out. And he decides, I want it back. Because he's a Levite, if he has the money, he can go back to Ruby and say, I'm going to buy my house back. He gives her the money that she paid. And guess what? He gets his house back. There's something else interesting about that. The year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee. That, is, that happened every 49 years. Every seven sevens of years. Seven represented a complete cycle with the Lord, the way He set things up. Every 49 years, if Clifford sold his house and Ruby bought it, but it was the 48th year of the Jubilee, next year he gets his house back without paying for it. The land for a Levite returned to the original owner every Jubilee year. So if you were going to buy a house from a Levite, you would kind of want to know where you were in the cycle of the Jubilee, right? Otherwise, it's like, I bought it yesterday, and tomorrow they get it back. Uh-oh. So, that, and why? Why did God make that provision for the land? Because there was no land grant for them, and this way, their homes could never be permanently taken from them. So they always had a place. Now, let me show you one more thing. Let's talk about, remember we talked a while ago, I made a city out of that. Let's just come over here. Let's say, here's the city. These 48 Levitical cities were walled cities. They, they, were, def, they, they were made for a defense. But not only, live, and by the way, there were other people besides Levites living in the city. It's just that they had homes in the city that they could never permanently lose. There was one other thing that was given to them. Outside of the city, there were pasture lands that were set up out there. And they had pasture lands to grow their own livestock or their own grains or whatever. And those Levites could not sell their pasture land. They could sell the property inside the city, but not the pasture lands out here. That never got to be sold. And so out here as well, there were areas that were set up where houses were set up. All throughout, I mean, suburbs grew up around the city, pasture lands were around the city, and the city was walled. Now don't confuse a Levitical city with a city of refuge. There were only seven cities of refuge, and that's where if you accidentally, if you did something that accidentally caused the death of someone else, the system of justice worked like this. If you could make it to one of these cities of refuge, the avenger of blood could not come in and kill you over this. And it was a way for the justice system to separate out murder from manslaughter. So there was a place, now this is an important part, I'm not just giving you this for no reason. The priests were the, those cities of refuge were also Levitical cities. You do understand, not every Levitical city was a city of refuge, but every city of refuge was a Levitical city. So, and you know who was in charge of maintaining all of that? The priest. That was their job there in those cities of refuge. Now, knowing that background uh, of all of that, and that there are the cities and the suburbs and the pasture land, knowing all of that, now let's pick this up in Second Chronicles 10. So the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was of God, that the Lord might perform his word, which he spake by the hand of Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. We're talking about Jeroboam, the guy that's going to take over the northern kingdom here. And when all Israel saw that the king would not hearken unto them, the people answered the king, saying, Now look what they're saying. Now by the way, they want Jeroboam, but this is their response to Rehoboam. This is the, look what they're saying here. What portion have we in David? Rehoboam is a descendant of David. They're saying, what portion do we have in David? 
and we have none inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents, O Israel. And I should have outlined this too because it's important. And now David, seed of thine own house. So all Israel, where are they? They're in Shechem. They've all come to Shechem to crown the king. And he just got through telling them, I'm going to be tougher on you than my father was. And they're going, oh yeah? And so they say, what portion do we have in David? We don't have any inheritance with the son of Jesse. Every man to your own tents. And David, see to your own house. So all Israel went to their tents. But as for the children of Israel that dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. So he reigned over these, but these guys said, we don't have any part with that. Now notice the terminology that they're saying. This is a public declaration. What portion have we in David? Why are they saying David? He's dead. You know what they're talking about? They're not just talking about the man David. You know what they're talking about? Rehoboam is of the... He's of the house of David. In other words, he's in the line from David. He's supposed to be sitting on the throne. When Israel rebels, they go, what portion do we have in David? If this is the way you want to be, we don't want the house of David ruling over us. We've already seen who they're going to choose, Jeroboam. And we have none inheritance in the son of Jesse. David was the son of Jesse. That's what they're talking about here. Hey, forget all of that, that part with them. Every man to your tent. So, you know what? We're out of here. We're done with this. We're not doing. We're not going to. We're not going to have you. And now, David, see to thine own house. Now, wait a minute. They are talking about the house of David by saying David. They're talking about Rehoboam. <coughs> he says, "See to your own house." It's because of this. You don't have any connection with us anymore. Go see to your own house. We're done with you. Ten tribes have cast him off. Ten tribes don't have anything to do with that. And so Rehoboam only has two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Then King Rehoboam sent Hadaram, that was over the tribute, and the children of Israel stoned him with stones. See, Rehoboam sent a guy. He's going to be a messenger of Rehoboam. Here was their response. We'll kill him. So they do. They stone him with stones, and it says that he died. But King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. And Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. Do you see what's going on there? That They said, look, we don't have anything to do with the house of David. We have no portion in that. In fact, when he sends that messenger, they kill him. What does he do? Jumps on his chariot and he gets out of Dodge. Because he knows they're going to, you know, I'm going to use the word that Paul's using, they have cast him off. That's the issue that we're going to look at here. And so from that point on, Rehoboam knows he's going to have to, he's going to, have to reply, rely on these southern tribes only. Is there going to be much trade going on between the two? Is there going to be any military help between the two? No, not only that, they're going to be at odds with each other. And so, take a look, 2 Chronicles 11.5. And Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. Guess who those cities of defense were primarily for? The northern kingdom. That's who he was building the defense against, those folks up there. Now look with me in verse 11. And he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them, and the store of victual and of oil and wine. And in every several city he put shields and spears and made them exceeding strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. Do you see what he's doing? He's putting stockpiles of supplies and stockpiles of weaponry. He's getting himself ready here militarily and, um, and he's building up stores of goods because he realizes he, I mean he's anticipating he's going to be attacked and he's going to go to war so now verse 13 and the priest and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coast for the Levites 
left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest office unto the Lord. Now we're going to read the rest of this passage, but this is the issue we've talked about in Romans 13. They said, Jeroboam and his son said, all these priests, remember those Levitical cities spread out throughout? They said, we don't want those guys. Anybody know why? We don't want these Levites down here. It's, it's Jeroboam and his sons. Why is it Jeroboam doesn't want those Levitical priests living up there in Israel? Do you remember what he did? We read it, not today, but we read it not too long ago. He, he made two golden calves, remember? And he said, these are the gods that brought you up out of Egypt. And he put them up there in Israel because he didn't want them going down there to Jerusalem on the feast days because if they did, oh man, he, they, they would abandon him and he knew it. And he said, I can't have that. So why get rid of the Levitical priest? Why get rid of them? Because they're promoting the true thing in Jerusalem. Here's the other thing. But why not just say, don't listen to them? Why not just say, why cast them off? Why go to that much trouble? It's because what he's about to do, they will not be in agreement with at all. And you know what's going to happen? He's going to cast them off, and they're going to cast him off. This again, illustrating what, what is going on with that verse 15. And he ordained him priest for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. So he didn't just dismiss them. He didn't just say, hey, you need to go over and tell the priest they're, they're not going to be needed anymore. He made a public declaration that they were not welcome there anymore. We're going to do something completely different and we're distancing ourselves from that group. And so what does he do? It says he ordained his own priest for the high places. Take a look at verse 28. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places, and made priest of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And the reason he had to make his own priest is because he cast off those priests. Remember the definition that we looked at earlier on about what it means to cast something off. So, let me ask you this. Is Jeroboam going to hide his idolatry? No, it's, a, it's, it's public. He, he is, is he disassociating himself with what's going on with the Levitical priesthood in Jerusalem and the feast days? Absolutely. They're going to wind up, and by the way, when they distance themselves from God and cast God off, I don't know if you recall this, but the other day when I showed you what the works of darkness were doing, and it said that they had cast the word of the Lord behind them, and then we read the other verse, and it said, God said, and they have cast me behind their backs. And when they do that, they're going to go away, and Assyria is going to come in and take them. But remember what we read earlier in the first session? But I'll save Judah. Israel's doing this, but I'll save Judah. And then Judah got worse than Israel. And God says during the time of Manasseh, here it comes. So, uh, verse, uh, 2 Chronicles eleven sixteen. 16. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their heart to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong three years. 
For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. Well, you already know that if they were walking in the way of David and Solomon, no wonder God was preserving them. And no wonder Assyria takes over the northern kingdom. So those are people that wanted to follow the Lord and walk in His way. And, and so here's what Jeroboam does. He sets up all these high places. He sets up these golden calves. He makes priests to the lowest of the people. And boy, these guys were winners. These guys were, or as my dad used to say, wieners. Because they, they were real stinkers. Remember, they were the ones in charge, not just of the Levitical cities, the Levites, but the cities of refuge. Well, you still have cities of refuge. And I want to I end this session by telling you about how bad these guys were. We're not going to do a lot, but I do have a couple of things. They were supposed to be the guardians over the cities of refuge so that if someone accidentally killed someone, they could come to this city and be saved alive. And you know what happened? These priests that Jeroboam got together to be over the high places, instead of protecting those that were coming into these cities, here's what they did. Hosea is going to talk about this. Remember, he's the prophet to Israel, the northern kingdom. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Gilead is a city of them that work iniquity and is polluted with blood. And as troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent for they commit lewdness. I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is the whoredom of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. You know what these priests did? They got together in bands and laid wait along the roads. And when somebody was coming into the city, they robbed them and took their stuff. Lovely to be living in Israel, right? The works of darkness are producing such great things. It makes you wonder, why do men embrace the works of darkness when they produce such atrocities? And someone could say, well, if you're the one doing the atrocity, you're getting all the, the spoils, you think it's a great thing. And that's why God says, oh, you think this is so great? When I pour out my wrath on this, you'll find out how great that was. But these are the priests that Jeroboam... So, you know what? If you actually killed somebody and you thought, I'll flee to a city of refuge, that might be the very thing that gets you killed. So there was no harbor there in Israel for any of that. So here's the point that I'm trying to make. And if I could take you all the way back to end this session to what we saw at the very front. Sorry. To repudiate or disown to the point of publicly declaring one's distaste for and refusal to be identified with or associated with that which one has cast off. That we, we see this issue taking place all throughout the Bible. That's why I'm saying when we define this term, we're looking at that from the standpoint of all the times that it has been used and what was going on when that kind of, of thing is being described. Everybody with me on that? So I think that's the basic understanding that we're supposed to take with us when God says, I want you to view those works of darkness, and now you can fill in the blank for any of the examples that I've given you today. The same way Rehoboam felt about, I'm sorry, that Jeroboam felt about the Levites. How about this? The way God, as he got to Manasseh, the way God felt about Israel. Actually, Judah, but when he said, you're not going to be my people, I'm not going to be your God. You know what? I'm not staying in this temple. I'm moving out and I'm leaving completely. I, you're going to go away captive and you're going to pine away in your enemy's lands. And, I'm going, and, and it is so, so much so that the nations around them get to thinking 
God is completely through with Israel. But I showed you two times where he comes back after all that and says, no, it's not going to be a permanent end. There is going to be a remnant that's going to come back and I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to give them the benefits of the new covenant. I'm going to put a, a new heart in them and I'm going to do that. But for those that don't want to do that, then they're going to get exactly what's coming to them. And God says, you know how I felt about that back there? I was casting them off. You know how Jeroboam felt about those Levites? And he was casting them off. And I showed you a couple of other examples. So when Paul writes and says, you've seen these works of darkness and you know what they are and you know what they're producing and you have an understanding of the controversy between God and the adversary, there's a measure of your being conformed to the image of Christ and Satan also is going to see the degree of how you think about those works of darkness just like God thinks about them. All of that is going to take place and, God, and God's looking at that and saying, and if you're thinking about them the way I am and you're going to be conformed to the image of my son and you really understand this controversy, you are going to publicly, when you run into these works of darkness in your everyday life and those things are made manifest, you are going to publicly refuse to be identified with them and declare your disdain for them. That is the issue of casting off the works of darkness. And when Satan sees that, that's a signal. But now we have another issue. And that's the putting on of the armor of light. And I told you that was a package. And so we need to consider the first part of that package and then we'll consider the second part of that package. And, the, and, and we'll do that. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer and we'll be done. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace to us. Thank you for a revelation of Scripture that uh, takes these terms and talks about them in ways that we can comprehend what's going on and then exhorting us with those terms today in the dispensation of grace. We're grateful, Lord, to have this book. We realize that it's because of this that we're able to be edified unto godliness. It's by, because of what we understand about this issue that we're able to labor with you and your operation against the adversary and what he's trying to produce in this world by means of his works of darkness. And I pray, Lord, that we would cast off those works of darkness because we realize what it is that they're producing. We realize who's behind them. And we realize where they're taking this world. We realize that there is an impact that's being made on godly people because of these works of darkness. And Satan means to, to intimidate us and to get us to back off and, 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 to, and, and to, to be reserved about this issue. And I pray, Lord, that what has been generated in us is a godly disdain and abhorrence for these things, that we would have an enthusiasm to cast them